back at it for the last session now. It seems like everybody still has energy. I'm impressed. Uh, it's been a long day. Uh, and so we'll start with CS Plus Economics, which you know is a f close place to me. This is an area that I work in quite a bit. And we have some of our students here. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy to hand it off to Federico to give the overview of this area for everybody. So Federico, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Um, so we're talking about CS and economics um, at Caltech and uh, you know, more, more broadly. So let me um, give you a, a little bit of a flavor of, of what kind of topics um, I we think about when we think about CS and economics, or what are the challenges, and also give you a little bit of an introduction to CS and economics at Caltech. You know, what, um, who are the people doing it and, and what, do we do we what do we work on? So um, there are many economic markets and institutions which have some algorithmic components. Uh, this is particularly true um, these days with the, with the internet. Uh, to some extent, this has always been true, but, but, um, but now there's a whole set of new and important challenges uh, associated um, with markets uh, that happen over the internet. Um, here's one example that probably you face um, uh, very often, you know, maybe, maybe every day, which is what happens when you um, do a Google search. When you do a Google search, you will, you will notice that there are a few things that pop up which are, you know, have the, the word ad next, next to them. And um, these are sold, these are ads uh, that are sold by uh, Google. Um, and, um, you know, there are companies that, that buy them. And you, you might wonder how exactly this is, this is determined. So why is, so if you, go if you Google a hybrid car, why is it that, uh, you know, Honda comes out first, uh, then the Chevy Volt ad, then uh, the Ford, and then uh, the KVV ad uh, next, uh, the Blue Book um, ad next. So what determines that? Why, why do they come in this order? And why do, why do you see these ads? Why don't you see an ad for um, uh, Toyota? Uh, so this, you know, it turns out, it follows a, a fairly important piece of economic theory, which is that you should when you, in, in, a, in a marketplace, when you, um, you have people buying and selling uh, an item, there, there will be a difference between how much you're willing to pay for something and how much you actually pay for it. And uh, the very basic idea behind the order is that the, guy who, the ad who goes first pays exactly the amount of money that they would have to pay um, if they were to, to go second. So if, if the order, for example, is only, um, so they, they bid for, um, for uh, Google showing their ad, and if they order by the order by how much they bid, then the one who goes first bids um, pays uh, the second highest bid, and the one who goes second pays um, the third highest bid, and so on. In reality, it's more complicated than that because Google also takes into account the the quality in some sense of the ad. So you, what you pay is what you would have to pay if, given the quality differentials, you would be ranked second instead of first. And if you're second, you pay what you would have to pay to be ranked third instead of se uh, second, and so on. That's the very rough idea behind this. And this follows some very um, important and basic uh, economic principles. Um, as, I, I would, uh, as you'll see in a, in a couple of slides, uh, it's not by chance that I picked this uh, example at Caltech. Um, kind of the big picture of the area is that in CS and Econ, there are a certain specific set of interdisciplinary issues that, that come up. They have to do with the role of incentives and algorithms. You know, incentives are a very important topic in economics. You, know, you have agents that you can't tell them what to do. You know, we are not engineers, economists. We try to set things up so that when people act uh, autonomously, they, they do what we you know, hope that the system ends up doing. Um, so what, how do these things interact? Um, what is the computational performance of economic algorithms and, and marketing institutions? How do you trade off uh, economics and um, economic and computational efficiency? In economics, you have this idea about efficiency, and you know it's, it's totally different from what efficiency means in the computational sense. Um, but but these two things are related, and, and there's a trade-off between the two. Similarly, with revenue. So if you are uh, working for a firm, and then you know what you care about is is revenue, and you wanna um, you, you wanna trade off revenue and uh, and computational efficiency. Um, at Caltech. Uh, um, Caltech has been a leader in this area from, from its beginning. It's, it's an area that really took off in, in the late 90s, beginning of the 2000s, that, and Caltech has been, you know, has had a, present, a presence in this area uh, ever since with the Lee Center and with the 
uh, social and information sciences lab, CISL, which is you know what is really active uh, these days, um, is a truly interdisciplinary group. It's, it has uh, faculty from both social sciences and from engineering and um, uh, from from in ENS and, and HSS. Um, even some people from humanities, actually, not only social, social sciences. Um, there's one faculty with a joint appointment in computer science and economics. Uh, we have shared grants, postdocs, students. We have a weekly seminar. We all get together over lunch, and, um, and we discuss the, the latest research in, the, in this area. So it's, it's very much an active um, area of research. Uh, here's a uh, <coughs> quick picture of the faculty that's involved in the at, the at the intersection. Uh, and this is really a unique um, kind of Caltech effort. This it's very easy to do this, set it this up, this kind of interdisciplinary effort at, at Caltech will be much harder to do in other um, universities. Um, so um, let me just give you a, a very brief overview of the uh, um, trajectory of research in this area at Caltech, and then I will pick one very specific example and tell you a little bit about it in detail. Um, so CISL um, was founded in 2002. It was part of the IST initiative that I think Adam mentioned yesterday. Um, there was his very early work on auctions. So this idea that I mentioned at the very beginning about how uh, the ads, so when you do a Google search, how the ads are shown to you and how much you pay, that idea uh, was already present in two local startups, uh, GoTo.com go and Overture, uh, which were um, started here in, in, in Pasadena. And uh, uh, the auction design uh, received um, input from Caltech faculty. Uh, so uh, they... Uh so the, this, this idea of this, that you pay um, what you would have to pay to be next in the, in the position you get, that very, that very basic economic uh, idea, uh, which is um, founded in, in, in uh, some principles of, of, of economics, that, that you know, came from, from this, from this startup. Later, Overture what was bought up by Yahoo, so it was incorporated into, into the, the Yahoo search engine. Um, uh, another a uh, piece of history is uh, the work on combinatorial auctions. So that, um, let, me, let me tell you just, just very briefly what combinatorial auctions mean. So imagine you're gonna set up a market for Lego pieces. Well, then different peop uh, you know, if you just had to sell these pieces, y you realize it's, it's gonna be, um, it is gonna, it's not gonna be a very good idea to sell each of these pieces just individually, because some of you, you know, you wanna build different things with them. You know? Like some of you wanna build, um, the uh, Starship Enterprise, others want to be the Millennium Falcon, and there are different set of pieces you need for each of these. So, um, you know, just pricing each one at individual value when the packet you want to make with each one of them is totally different, it's not going to be the best way of selling these things. On the other hand, if you just sell the pieces to build each of these things, uh, it becomes too complex because there are just too many things that people want to build with these pieces. So just setting up uh, selling the bundles for each possible thing you can build with uh, Lego is is uh, is also not, not 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 a good idea. So the, the combinatorial auctions try to, um, in a sense, um, trade off economic efficiency and what is computationally achievable with this very very big problem that you have of um, when you when you when you're piecing together um, uh, different items. So um, Caltech faculty has been involved actually from uh, the 80s. Um, on uh, works um, which had to do with uh, airport uh, landing slots, which have a bit of the, f of the Lego uh, flavor, because if you get a slot to land in Chicago, you know, some people may use it to connect Chicago to Toronto, others to connect chi Chicago to New York, um, uh, others to, you know, to make Chicago a hub. Um, and and the exactly how you sell off this airport slot has this kind of fla uh, flavor. It's a different um, application to trains that, that also Caltech students and, and faculty were involved with. Um, and then, the, you know, the maybe the most famous one is FCC Spectrum, which is when um, FCC um, uh, sold off a very big, a very big chunks of Spectrum that you, you use today when you call on your, on your cell phone. Um, the F FCC Spectrum has exactly that f um, property too. You know, you uh, some people want to buy adjacent pieces of, of Spectrum because you know, that's, that's what you know, makes sense from, uh, from the engineering uh, viewpoint. But then exactly how you price and sell all these things has, has this uh, combinatorial um, aspect. Um, there are many other um, lines of work. Uh, there are uh, very important um, uh, projects in social networks, uh, network market, matching markets, which is what I 
The specific thing I want to tell you about this matching market, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in detail later. Uh, smart grid and electricity markets and, and privacy. Um, I won't have um, time to talk about this in, in detail. Um, I do want to mention that today CISR is part of the Lind Institute, which is um, uh, the, the main uh, economics and management uh, sciences institute at Caltech. And um, so the, uh, uh, the funding for postdocs and for uh, seminars and so on uh, these days comes from the from the Lind Institute. So we're very grateful for the support. Um, okay, so the, the I want to tell you about a very specific problem um, uh, in matching, which is school choice. This is you know it's an interesting problem. It has algorithmic and economic aspects. It has also aspect of social policy. Uh, so th th I think it's um, and it's also very easy to recognize what the what the problems, what the tensions are. Um, so what what is uh, school choice? So school choice is this idea that um, you know when you assign uh, children to schools to public schools um, you shouldn't do it in a in a way that's purely uh, centralized you, you know, decide you know who goes where you should also take into account where people want to go so you want to allow um, the parents or maybe, you know, possibly the children's preferences to matter in how you assign children to public schools um, you may also want to do some social policy which is something i want to go back to later if i have time um, so, because it's public school, you, you can't use money and prices. If you if you privatize all the schools, then you could do this. You know, but but that that's something that you know the public don't don't want to do. We're, we're going to keep the um, you know the public schools uh, pri public, and we're going to do it do this without prices or money. So um, the the story of the economist's involvement in this um, comes um, from uh, a problem discovered with the Boston um, school district. It's a, it's a has been associated with Boston purely for historical reason, but it's very common in many, many places in the world they, the, the same problem um, appears. So what is the problem with Boston? So uh, I will show you a really uh, trivial example that illustrates what the problem is. Um, so suppose you have three children, they are Anne, Lisa, and Mary, and they have two schools. You have Spade Suit Charter and Diamond Elementary, and you're going to assign the children to these schools. Now, I told you I would I want to take into account the preferences of these people. Where do they want to go to school? So suppose Anne would, you know, Diamond Charter is a really popular school, and both Anne and Lisa would rather go to Diamond instead of going to Spade. But Mary uh, has the opposite preferences. She lives closer to Spade. She would like to go to Spade. Okay? Now, the schools, they have priority rankings over students. And the source of these are, you know, they could be test scores, so they want they rank high performance students over low lower performance students, but, but they have many other sources as well. So they want to, for example, rank sibling, uh, children who have a sibling in the school over children who don't have a sibling in the school, children who live within walking distance to the school about children who don't, and, th and there are many other sources of, um, of student preferences of, over children. So that, you know, Diamond ranks the children and Lisa Mary, and Spacesuit ranks the children Lisa, Mary, and Anne. So what does Boston do? Boston does, or did, what I think, what the first thing you, you think of is they let each one apply to each of the schools and then let each school decide, okay? That's the most natural, the most obvious way of doing this. So if we run that algorithm, it's a very simple one. So I, on the left, I, I have the preferences of the schools and of the children, just to remind you of what they were. And on the right, I'm going to run the algorithm. So I, have, I lined up the schools, I have the diamonds and I have, you know, have, and I have the spade. And first of all, Anne and Lisa both apply to Diamond because that's the school they want to go to. Then Mary applies to Spade because that's the school she wants to go to. So what happens now? Well, uh, the schools ch choose, and I'm going to make the assumption that each school only has one seat, okay? Just to, just to make the example work. So Anne will get into the school to, s to, um, to Diamond, and Mary gets into uh, Spade. Lisa can then go and try apply to spade, but you know the the seat is taken, so she's out. So basically, she she goes to you know, she's off the system. She you know, she she needs to figure something else out. Okay, nothing for Lisa. So if if you think about this, and and the parents of the Boston children thought about this, there's something um, you know Lisa could have done to avoid this problem, right? And if you think about this for a little bit, I. I think you, you know what it is. It's you, she, she should have lied. She shouldn't have told the system that she prefer um, that she prefer diamond uh, over spade. If she instead had ranked her second best school first, 
then she would be competing for um, th th this would have been the first iteration of the algorithm she would be competing with Lisa um, for uh, sorry with Mary for for spade and spade would prefer Lisa over Mary so then you know uh, Lisa could have been better off hmm? and and this idea is um, very easy to see in this example. It's very easy to see when you think about how to assign your children to schools. So in Boston, there was this active group of parents um, that were getting together and discussing how best to manipulate the algorithm, how to lie to it in the best way so that you, you, know, you, you get the, the, the school you, uh, you want. So in come you know, a certain group of economists who um, uh, detected this problem, and they proposed um, a way of fixing it. B by the way, I should mention, this is what we mean by manipulable. Manipulable means that you know you can lie to lie to the system and then and then share, um, and then um, um, you know get, get something better. There, there's another um, aspect, uh, another word you, you may want to remember, which is it is unfair because you know Anne gets into the school, but Lee and Lisa doesn't, but Lisa was ranked higher. So what could Lisa do? She could sue, and this is something that the school district doesn't like. So unfair means open to litigation, in other words. So, uh, so you, you will see, if I have time, that th there, is, there is in the end a, a decision to be made between being fair and being efficient, which is a very common theme in economics, uh, you know, efficiency and fairness as being uh, not, not always compatible. And, um, and the school has always picked fairness over efficiency, school districts, um, beca because of this issue. Anyway, so, uh, so what's the fix? The fix is something called the gay shapley algorithm, so I'll very quickly tell you what it is. We start again, the preferences of the children and the schools are the same. Mm? And the first iteration of the algorithm, now Anne and Lisa both apply to Diamond, Mary applies to Spade. Anne is taken okay, over Lisa because Spa uh, Diamond ranks Anne over Lisa. And uh, Spade uh, takes Mary because you know, Mary is a good enough student to go to, to the school. But now in the second iteration, uh, we have Mary applying to Spade. And now, um, you know, you see where the two algorithms differ. So this algorithm is often called deferred acceptance algorithm. Because when Spade took Mary, it was only temporary. Hmm? If something comes, comes along that's better for Spade, they are free to switch. So that's why Mary is in green there. She, she's, she's actually being rejected. So now the school... It's like dating, yes. So in the... In the, yeah, in, in the original problem by Gale and Shapley, that's, that, was exactly the, that was exactly the story behind it. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and, and, but you will see the voice litigation. So, so uh, anyway, so, so what happens then is Lisa gets to, gets to the school, and uh, uh, the one who's left out is, um, is Mary. So what are the advantages of this algorithm? Well, it turns out, this is not so easy to see, but it's nevertheless true, it's not manipulable, so it is in your best interest to report, to rank the schools, the order in which you actually rank them. So, so that there's, there's no need to get together with all the other parents and you know, elaborate how to best to manipulate this mechanism. There's no effort that goes into trying to cheat and game the, the, um, uh, the mechanism. And there's also no sort of unfairness in you know, people who who are more clever or better at doing this, you know, um, performing better than the that people who are not. Um, the outcome is fair in the sense that it satisfies a property called justified envy, um, which is also called stability, and, and that, that avoids lawsuits. So this is what I meant when I said um, that was lawsuits. The only problem is it may be inefficient. What do I mean by that? Well, when this algorithm is, has finished running and it spits out an assignment of children to schools, you might be able to reassign the children to the schools in a way that makes all the children better off. So that's possible. Okay? However, wh what you come up with when you do that will not be uh, fair. It won't, it won't satisfy this property of justified envy. Okay? So, so then, you know, when, when economists have sat down with um, public school officials and give them the option, so do you prefer an algorithm that's sufficient? Do you prefer one that is, you know, litigation proof or, you know, uh, is, is fair, um, they have always preferred the fair one. Uh, I'm about to run out of time, so let me just quickly tell you that the story of this is, um, is very interesting. 
Um, so Galen Shapley wrote a paper in the 60s, which was about uh, was ostensibly about, about college admission, but the story was about dating. So if you read the article, they talk about um, boys and girls and uh, and uh, and so on. Uh, then uh, one of one of the um, one of the two Gale was at some point giving a, a kind of like a public lecture um, about this problem, and someone from the audience, this was in the late 50s or 60s, uh, comes up and, and introduces it and says, "Well, you know, you know, I'm a medical doctor, and this is exactly how we match, you know, interns um, who finish medical school to uh, internship. Um, sorry, medical students when they just finish medical school to in, in uh, internships at hospitals, and." Um, and it turns out that, uh, you know, for somewhat different reasons, the medical profession, the hospitals and the medical schools had arrived at the same algorithm. And that's what they were using to assign very big numbers of medical students to hospitals. And this continues until today. So this is the web page from you know, two days ago, the web page of the medical match. Um, um, so this is, you know, it's called the match. And, uh, and, and this is when you, if you're a medical, uh, if you're a student uh, at a medical school, this is how you, this is what you do at the end of the, um, of your studies to, to do an internship. Uh, so this research received uh, a Nobel Prize uh, a couple of years ago, Al Roth and Shapley, uh, it's Lloyd Shapley. Uh, David Gale had, had passed away so uh, by then. Um, and um, I, I think I'm out of time, but this, these are some of the properties of this and um, you know, some of the main challenges, things that we are working on now have more to do with you know, social policy and how uh, school districts care about the composition of <coughs> each school. So this is another new set of challenges that, that we're working on for this. Okay.